I'd like to talk about exploring Mars for evidence of habitable environments and life. And it really is a fascinating story that goes back more than a century. Uh, of course, we have basic questions about what Mars the planet is all about. But in many ways, the best way to address these questions is to address them in parallel with the question of the searching for life itself. And so in that vein, I'd like to review uh, you know, Mars exploration over the past several decades and how we're getting ever better at answering this question of is there a second example of life in our solar system. And you can see from the two graphics on this first slide that um, early Mars might have been quite a different place than Mars today. And of course, that adds to the excitement as well as the promise that indeed life once existed there. Uh, the talk outline then is really uh, just to get a start to compare Mars and the Earth. The Earth is obviously the one place where we know life exists today. And therefore, the characteristics that it shares with Mars are quite relevant to the search for Mars life. Uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, um, uh, recent uh, exploration of Mars, made several key discoveries that are quite important for the search for habitable environments and life. And so I'd like briefly to review some of the key relevant discoveries that they've made. Uh, this is being taped in early 2012, and uh, at this point we look forward to the Curiosity rover, which will land on um, August of 2012, and it represents really an extension of this uh, long-term effort to explore Mars and, and search for life. Um, and this is put in sort of a lecture format, so I've included periodically uh, some questions after each of the sections uh, that students might want to address and uh, use it to test their comprehension. The next slide then starts the story, at least the, this lecture, with the uh, sort of knowledge level of Mars some hundred years ago. A very famous astronomer, Percival Lowell, really was quite fascinated with Mars and he had a, a, a state-of-the-art telescope of that time um, in his uh, Arizona observatory. And he uh, created this map that you see here of Mars showing these linear features sort of connecting nodes, these little black dots that you see. Uh, and he became quite excited by you know, these features that he perceived, uh, indicating that perhaps this was evidence of an advanced uh, intelligent life, uh, one that was perhaps um, under stress because of the very, he, what he would describe as a very dry arid environment on Mars and that these straight lines were perhaps canals that were connecting sources of water to agricultural fields and that perhaps these nodes represented cities. Well, you can imagine that this created quite a stir in the public at that time um, and therefore heightened the interest uh, and certainly contributed to the interest in Mars and Mars exploration in the years that followed. But I also like to start here just to remind us all of just what our state of knowledge was just a little over 100 years ago and compare that to what you're going to hear next. That's a remarkable statement about the achievements of the 20th century and now moving into the 21st century. Uh, based on uh, Lowell's uh, accounts and also the, you know, the novelists and others of the time, uh, there was this perception of these civilizations having these cities and these canals and, uh, you know, H.G. Wells, you know, wrote uh, a major piece about this, about these uh, civilizations. And Orson Welles in 1938 actually, um, you know, did a radio broadcast of Martians attacking the Earth. And, of course, it was meant to be entertainment. It was meant to be a, a sort of science fiction. But the public at that time took it quite seriously. There was a lot of... Um, you know, public uh, angst about this, and uh, it just illustrated that even in 1938, people were quite prepared to believe that this was this picture might represent Mars, and that we were potentially under threat of invading forces. Uh, and again, this underscores the first of all the perception of what Mars environment was like at that time, 1938, and also just um, our really rudimentary knowledge about that planet. And of course. Uh, as observations got better through the 20th century, uh, astronomical observations, it became clear that the atmosphere of Mars was much thinner than the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, perhaps only a few percent of Earth's atmospheric pressure. And this uh, led others, even artists like Ch Ch Chesley Bonsdale, to paint, and he was a very famous painter of planetary images, uh, to paint a picture of a more bleak Mars, one that perhaps only algae could survive at, 
He still had the straight canals there going, as you see in this image. But it represented a move towards a more, um, perhaps, let's say, realistic view of what Mars was like, although he still clung to the potential of, of algal life living at the surface of Mars. And you can see in the foreground a snowbank, and that's actually consistent with ast astronomical observations of some kind of an ice cap, ac ice caps actually, at the poles of Mars. And so in a way now, by 1955, we're giving way to a more realistic view of Mars, but one that still had a ways to go to reach what we now understand as, as the, uh, surface, the surface environment of Mars. The modern space age, of course, I think would really be defined for Mars as the age in which we were actually able to send probes that were close enough to Mars to provide observations that are superior to any that we could achieve using telescopes uh, based on the Earth. And uh, certainly the Mariner 4 flyby in 1965 represents a key opening chapter of this phase of exploration. And it was a very sobering observation indeed of Mars. It only flew by Mars, but what you could see here is a sort of a cratered surface uh, that quite frankly bears strong resemblance to the moon. And of course we have much better observations of the moon because of its proximity. And even before we went there, we were pretty sure this was going to be a very dry, bleak, and un uninhabitable place. And so by the observations of Mariner in 1965 and maybe a few years after that, uh, we really were sort of at the nadir of our perception about the habitability of Mars. We had certainly gone full swing from the days of Percival Lowell and even Chesley Bonstell. We now were wondering whether there was anything more to Mars than our moon as far as the prospects for life were concerned. So this is sort of the low point in our perception about Mars as a potential habitat for life. But as the Viking mission was launched in 1976, and actually some of the uh, previous, uh, uh, an orbiter also was launched even before Viking, uh, our modern perception of Mars began to take a swing towards the positive as far as the potential for habitable environments were concerned. For one thing, these spacecraft of the 70s started to make observations of the surface of Mars that bear resemblance to some features on the Earth. For example, if you look to the left of this image a bit, uh, you'll see uh, three features along the left limb here, which are large volcanoes on Mars, uh, very reminiscent of volcanoes on the Earth, indicating that a key geologic process was shared by both planets. Also, that large gash that you see running across the uh, front of Mars, uh, which we now know as Valles Marineris, uh, represented some kind of a, a rifting or breaking apart of the Martian crust at some time in the past, rather reminiscent of the mid-ocean ridge system or other tectonic features on the Earth, again speaking to a similarity between Mars and the Earth. And so the closer we looked at Mars, the more we began to see that, uh, yes, it's quite different from the Earth, but perhaps there are some similarities as well. So this, in a way, placed Mars, Mars firmly between the Earth and the Moon, somewhere in the middle there between them, as sort of an intermediate example of a planet and therefore a planetary environment. Uh, this uh, little video here shows Mars on the left and Earth on the right, and it shows that they both have the same tilt. Uh, the little highlighting that you see in, this, in the lower part of these two globes indicates that we have seasons. We have winters and summers, both on the Earth and on Mars, and so that's another similarity. Also, we have highlands and lowlands, the lowlands on the Earth being the ocean basins, the lowlands, as you can see, on Mars being in the northern hemisphere. And so again, this speaks to some interesting similarities between uh, Earth and Mars. And so that just heightens our interest now and it exemplifies what I meant when I said that our sort of view of Mars as potentially habitable at some point uh, is more positive than it was during those dark years of the 60s with our first flyby observations. And so if we look now at the Earth, just to get a, drill in a little bit more closely to the surface environment, uh, the upper panel, of course, shows the very familiar Mercator projection of continents and oceans on the Earth, the green highlighting the uh, very productive forests and grasslands on the Earth, and really uh, is a very familiar landscape to us. One that's down below is showing you the same thing, but with the ocean removed, and showing you and sort of highlighted really in most cases there in orange, this mid-ocean ridge rift system, which is a volcanic feature. Uh, it encircles the Earth and very much embodies the geologic activity, the volcanic activity of the Earth. And quite frankly, that's a very important aspect contributing to the habitability of our planet. So volcanism 
is a very important feature of a planet uh, regarding the potential for hosting a habitable environment. So in a way then, just to make the transition to what I'll show next, we can think of the continents as being the highlands of the Earth and the ocean basins, uh, as you can see in, the, in blue in the upper panel or in the uh, blue and, and orange areas in the lower panel, these being sort of the uh, Earth lowlands, uh, a key aspect of Earth geography. Uh, let us now move to the Mars image. Again, we're looking at a Mercator projection. And as you can see, the blue in the upper part of this uh, representation represents the northern lowlands of Mars. And as I just to refer back to Earth, it's analogous to uh, the, the ocean basins on the Earth, although obviously there's no ocean sitting in that northern lowlands on Mars. Uh, then we have the southern highlands, which are shown in the warmer colors. In fact, if you look in the lower left here, uh, there's a little, little key that indicates elevation in kilometers, where minus 8 is minus 8 kilometers below the, the mean uh, sort of elevation on Mars. And as you can see, Hellas Basin over here, this large impact basin, represents the lowest area on Mars. And then at the top end, we have the big volcanoes, I, these three I mentioned earlier, uh, which really represent the highest uh, areas, highest places on Mars. And as you can see from our little graph, that's at plus 12 kilometers. So that's the key thing. And you can see now that the similarities between the Earth and Mars. One difference here, of course, be these very prominent craters every place, which on the Earth are much less um, obvious because of the constant weathering and resurfacing of the Earth caused by our climate. But the key point I want to make here with this image is that the density of craters that you see in the sort of middle and lower parts of the image here represent the oldest surfaces on Mars. And to the extent that the early Mars environment might have been more interesting for life than later on, these old surfaces represent very important targets of exploration. Uh, whereas, as you can see, the blue to the north showing much fewer craters represents a a, a younger resurfacing of, the, of that part of the planet and therefore maybe wouldn't be the best place to look for evidence of ancient habitable environments and life. So the other interesting twist to this, though, is that now obviously we would want to explore that heavily cratered area in the sort of mid-latitudes to southern hemisphere, but we have to also land safely on Mars. And to do that, we need as much atmospheric density as possible as we descend to the surface. And so that means that, yeah, we should visit the southern highlands, but we can't visit them too high. In fact, any color that you see here that's either orange, red, or uh, actually really yellow, orange, red, or that white at the top, those are elevations that are too high for us at the moment anyway to risk a landing uh, mission. And so uh, we have to balance our desire to go to these ancient terrains against our desire to land the spacecraft safely. So that's a key tension that we have to cope with in Mars exploration. But as um, we uh, move uh, closer and look at some of the features at the surface of Mars, we have really reason to be excited about that early environment that I mentioned. And that is these large channels that are flowing across the surface. They're now quite dry. You can see a little scale bar here on the lower right corner. That little tiny bar there is, is 10 kilometers. And that indicates that these are very large channels, which carried large amounts of water from the southern highlands, which in this case would be to the right, up down to the northern lowlands, which in this image would be off to the left. And you can see several examples of these features, this very prominent one at the top. Also another one that seems to erupt from beneath the surface and then flowing out towards the northern lowlands. And so this increased our excitement. And this was a a, an observation that was most clearly uh, documented by uh, the Viking mission again in the mid-70s. And so speaking again to a different early climate. And so the punchline from this, when uh, just going over what I've summarized uh, so far, is that the Martian environment has really been more Earth-like than that of any other planet in our solar system. Again, you see Earth on the left and Mars today on the upper right, and then the lower right, maybe a, an artist's representation of what Mars might have looked like some four plus billion years ago. Uh, it's clear that um, it has uh, some very interesting features that merit uh, closer inspection. And for this reason, Mars has been a, a major focus in planetary science exploration in the last uh, decade or two. Uh, the next slide then shows on the left, uh, uh, it's shown in highlighting in blue here, some of the channels and tributaries to the channels that were documented by the Viking imagery, illustrating, again, this point that water used to run across the surface. But these channels don't really look as robust or as dense 
as what we uh, see on the Earth. And so this led to the idea that maybe these are just draining groundwater that's coming up in springs, or in any case that the water activity on Mars was really, maybe it was there episodically, but not nearly what we see on the Earth. But just to show you the improvement of imagery, as on the right here, this is imagery uh, obtained from the Mars Global Surveyor mission, which uh, you know, was launched um, you know, in the past decade. And uh, the colors there are the same kinds of colors I showed you earlier with the Mars map, illustrating much better elevation control in our mapping of the surface. And the little yellow lines that you see running all over here represent the channels now that we can document using this higher quality image. Well, the interesting point is, is that the image on the right is taken of the same place that you're seeing on the left. And it just shows how superior resolution of the imagery is making for a much more exciting um, observation about Mars that, gee, these are now channel densities that are approaching drainage channel densities on the Earth, and the argument for precipitation having occurred at some time in the distant past on Mars seems to be very compelling now. So the key point is that our discoveries are very much tied to the quality of the observations that we can make, and that the superior orbital imagery that we've been enjoying now since the Mars Global Surveyor mission of 1996 uh, are been a, have been a clear driver in our exploration of Mars. And in fact, this image, which again is a Mercator projection showing the northern lowlands to the high upper part of the image and the southern highlands to the, to the lower part of the image, uh, highlights a, an inventory of features that are quite relevant to our evaluation of water. If you look in the upper left subpanel here, you see a, a nice dense drainage network that, that sort of channels water down towards this lower right part of the image. That is an example of what we are showing here as these little blue squiggles that you see all the way across this Mercator map. Up here in the upper right, we see a, a crater that has had a channel flowing into it and a channel flowing out. But in any case, it's a crater that seems to have had water in it at some point in the past, basically a crater lake. All these little red dots there that you see here with the white centers are examples of these types of crater lakes that we have been documenting on Mars. And as you see, just south of this, what we call the dichotomy boundary between the northern lowlands and the southern highlands, a very high density of these features, both the channels as well as the lakes, indicating that uh, there was a fair amount of precipitation at some time in the past on Mars to form these features. The only place where they seem sparse is in this area here, but that just happens to be the place where volcanism has covered this surface with lava flows and basically obscured these uh, features uh, where they happen to be too close to the volcanoes. So it's probably a reasonable ex uh, extrapolation to say that we had very dense features evidencing precipitation on Mars right just south of the dichotomy boundary. And this, after three more or more billion years of, of Mars history, that could have obscured a lot of the features that were once there. So the argument for precipitation and, and water on Mars, just from the landscape analysis alone, has become quite more compelling in recent years. So with this, a couple of thought questions to test your comprehension. One would be, in what ways is Mars similar to Earth? And name at least three characteristics that you can think of that are similar between Mars and Earth. So that's one question. And another one, of course, could be, how are Mars and the Earth different? Uh, provide at least three examples of, of that. And so I won't provide the answers now, but it is a bit of test of, of uh, your comprehension of what, what I've just explained. Okay, with that, let's move on. Again, as a, just as I said, better resolution images from orbit tell us a lot more about what Mars environments might have been like in the past. It's hard to argue that getting down on the ground and uh, looking up close and personal to rocks and other features is you know, an even more compelling way to really understand the story about Mars. These are some tools here that a geologist uses as he or she goes out into the field to analyze rocks and to try to understand the story that the rocks are telling him or her. Uh, the boots represent moving around, looking at different rocks, looking at different outcrops and features. So mobility is a very important character of a, of a field geologist. Uh, over on the left, we see uh, binoculars, glasses, and a hand lens representing the importance of observation, visual observations, first from a distance, then up close, and then really up close with a hand lens to observe something like you see uh, there, the rock sort of at the little lower left center there. Uh, the compass here represents the importance of the geologist knowing he, where he or she is in the field at any one time to, so that they can record their observations to build a map. 
The rock hammer represents the importance sometimes of breaking off the surface of a rock to get to a nice fresh interior. This little rock sample to the left of the hammer, of course, is something that's been sawed open so that you can see very nicely the fabric that's inside. So the ability to look at fresh uh, rock surface and then as the little tiny bottle to the left of the boot indicates, maybe even do some rudimentary analyses. This is just acid to see if the rock dissolves as a limestone would dissolve uh, to get more of a sense of the composition of the rock in the field. These are all very important aspects of, of, of field geology and one that we have tried to now replicate in rovers that have been built to go to the surface of Mars. In 1996, this little bread box size sojourner represented our first attempt to do this. And it really it made some interesting observations uh, about Mars, uh, element, uh, aspects about the composition of the rocks, indicating the, how the crust of Mars may have evolved with volcanic activity in the early days. Sojourner didn't really make a, a number of, of um, compelling observations about the story of water, even though we landed it in one of those ancient large channels. But it was really a significant mission as, as a, what it was designed to be, and that is a pathfinder. To really do a pathfinding mission to understand how to operate a rover on the surface of Mars and the types of instruments that would be important to really make the key observations to address this question of just how active and for how long did water exist on the surface of Mars. The, the benefits of our knowledge from Sojourner led directly to the design, successful design, I would add, of Spirit and Opportunity that were launched in 2003. And I'd like to go over a little bit, a summary of their findings, uh, just to illustrate the importance of that mission and how it feeds to our quest here to understand the potential for habitable environments on Mars. And then finally, the recent launch of Curiosity and landing in August of 2012 represents a further extension of our capabilities as well as our scientific knowledge of, of Mars and certainly what will hopefully lead to an increased scientific knowledge of the surface of Mars. So I'd like then just to st go back to our Mars map and now indicate the places where NASA has sent <laughs> some uh, spacecraft to the surface of Mars and uh, NASA landing sites as of 2011 uh, and to now circle both Opportunity and Spirit uh, here as uh, the two landing sites that we picked. And again, as you can see what I said earlier, we wi really wanted to get to the, north, to the uh, southern highlands of Mars, but we also had to land in a place safely, and so we are in these, this sort of green zone here, which represents sort of an intermediate uh, elevation on Mars. So first I will uh, uh, take us to the Opportunity Site just to get some of the key observations that were made by that. And this was a place that we picked based on evidence of a certain mineral called hematite, gray hematite, which indicated that liquid water might have been active at the surface. And when we landed there, uh, you're looking out from where we landed at an outcrop that's only about half a meter high here, as shown by this bar. But we've made an observation of a number of features that were consistent with water having been present. First of all, this yellowish color that you see here are rocks along the rim of the crater where we landed that show what we call sulfate minerals. These are minerals that are soluble in water and very much different from a volcanic rock. And they indicate that somehow water had to be involved in the, in the formation of these rocks. And so that was very exciting. Uh, we found, again, these iron oxide or hematite rich uh, concretions, uh, little spherical objects. You can see them littering the surface. We found they're in the rocks. And these are consistent with formation in, in a saturated water environment where the iron oxide precipitated, or actually probably as an iron hydroxide initially, precipitated out of a solution uh, and pretty much had to be an acidic solution to form these little concretion, these little spherules. Uh, we fi found another other, a bunch of other features, again, that were consistent with the presence of water, which I can elaborate a little bit more on the next slide. Here now we're zooming in a close-up of view of a rock, this using that little microscopic imager tool, uh, analogous to what a, a geologist would have. And here you see these little spherulitic hematite concretions embedded in the rock. We see uh, basically little cavities in the rock that used to contain some kind of a platy mineral, but has since been dissolved away. Well, the, just the fact that it's been dissolved away means that it was water soluble, which means water had to be involved. Um, and, but, and, and of course, but for us and many of us, the, one of the most exciting observations was the observation of these ripple crests, as you can see up here in the upper right. And these are the same kinds of ripples as you would see on a beach or in a lake or any place where water's flowing across the surface. So it not only indicates <coughs> that liquid water is present, 
but it indicated that the liquid water was present at the surface. And this in had carries a clear implication for the climate of Mars at that time. The climate had to permit liquid water to be stable at the surface of Mars, and that is not the case today. Mars is so dry and cold today that liquid water is not stable. And so this was a very important observation made by Opportunity. So as significant as these observations were, uh, just uh, they really represent you know, observations of just a half a meter of, of a rock layer. <coughs> we really would like to know more about what was the history of Mars' environment at that time. Over here, you see this uh, Eagle Crater, this little tiny crater where uh, Opportunity landed. And so we got into this mode of going to bigger and bigger craters. Here you see Endurance Crater, and then this very long drive over here to Victoria Crater. And now we have driven off and now arrived at Endeavor Crater, which is an even larger crater still. Why are we going to craters? Because craters dig down into the surface, subsurface. They expose more rock layers. So you can think of successive layers of rock as being successive pages in a, in a storybook about the early history of Mars uh, environment. And so if one page is very interesting, then the thing that you want to do with any good book or what record is to look at more pages to learn more about the progression of the story. And so by going to Endurance Crater, we go to more pages of the book. And when we got there, here's the view of the crater, 170 meters across, much bigger, actually 160 meters, much bigger than Eagle Crater and much deeper. And because of the depth, we're able to access this layer of rocks that you see here that tell us more about the story of this early environment. And to just be quite brief, basically it's a story of Playa Lakes, small standing bodies of water, much like the ones we saw evidence for back at our landing site, but also underlain by layers of what we call sand sheets, which represent, again, water, but not in standing mode, just moist sand, and then much thicker layers of what we can characterize as sand dunes. And so we think of a, an ancient landscape of sand dunes, wet sand sheets, and Playa Lakes, much like, for example, what you would see at White Sands National Monument in New Mexico. So now we get an idea about not only uh, more of through time of what the environment was like, but also more of what the landscape would have been like at that time. And the important thing is that it included standing bodies of water at the surface. So this mission of opportunity really uh, demonstrated that, yeah, that surface environment was early environment was really different. Water played a more prominent role. That's a big step towards the potential for habitable environments on early Mars. So let me now expand this uh, concept of habitable environments beyond just water. This little green cube you see here represents what I would say the locus of environments within which life could survive. And for that to be the case, there have to be at least three basic features satisfied. One is you have to have water available, and that's that horizontal axis here. Uh, it, if, it's too, if the things that are in the water are too dilute, you just can't get life going. But also, if there's just not enough water available to be chemically available, uh, life cannot take a foothold. Uh, but at the same token, the same environment has to have an available energy source. All of us need energy to survive. That's why we have you know, our meals during the day. That's why plants have to uh, absorb the sunlight to make energy for themselves. This is a key requirement for life. And of course, the third one is that we have to have the ingredients, the uh, carbon, the sulfur, the nitrogen, and, and other elements available for life uh, to build our cells. So all of these things have to be present at the same place at the same time. Can we demonstrate that that was ever the case at any place on Mars at any time in the past? With that, I'd like then to move to our other landing site uh, at um, the uh, Gusev Crater, which is really on the other side of the planet from where Opportunity landed at Meridiani, uh, to a crater <laughs> that clearly had water in it at some point. You see here Maadine Vallis flowing into the crater, and then eventually the crater overtopped, and water flowed uh, into the northern lowlands. And for good measure here, we even have a volcano nearby in the form of Apollinaris Patera. So just from the landscape of this view, you can see that water must have been there in the past. And so unlike the mineral that we found at the Opportunity site at Meridiani, it was the landscape that compelled us to land here at Gusev Crater, which you can see is a pretty good sized crater, 180 meters, kilometers across. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, however, though, when we landed way up here in the upper left corner, we landed on a vast plains of lava rock. <laughs> so even though this huge crater had water in it at one point, guess what? Subsequent to that time, lava flows had really covered much of this floor of this crater. Well, this is um, 
not great news for our little rover because our little rover makes a living actually analyzing rocks up close and personal for evidence of water. And if we had a big lava flow that covered all that evidence, then we've got a problem. You know, as they would say, Houston, we have a problem here. Well, the good news is that as we looked out from our landing site, you can see in the upper right image here, there were some mountains or hills off to the southeast, which looks different from these lava plains. And these are these Columbia Hills that you see now in the lower big image. Uh, you see also the, the orange represents our decision to drive over there. This is our trail, that we, our path that we took. And if you look very closely between the margin between the hills and the plains to the, to the west, you see what looks like almost like a shoreline feature. And this actually is the edge of the lava flow, indicating that these hills are something different. In fact, they're something that underlay the lava flow, and therefore they're probably older. And so this was the place to go to see if we could finally see evidence for water having played a role in Gusev Crater on Mars. And of course, we did drive over there, as this map shows, and we did indeed find some additional evidence for water. Uh, and just to be quite quick about this, uh, the indicators of liquid water uh, could be sort of a raid on a scale here of very low water availability to very high water availability. Clearly at the low end, if you're looking at fresh volcanic rocks that are uh, still pretty much unaltered by water, if you're looking at soil horizons, where both insoluble minerals are uniformly mixed with soluble salts, as you would expect in a very dry environment, where maybe only the wind is what's blowing things around, then that's not much evidence for water. But at the other end, if you're looking at, place, at, at deposits where the rocks have been altered to clays or, or salts or other things, and where they've even been transported around by water, this obviously represents a very extensive evidence for water having been present. And indeed, as we went to uh, the uh, Columbia Hills, Husband Hill, and some of the other features I'll mention, we did actually uh, find evidence that water had been quite extensively present. So in that sense, then, uh, Spirit had sort of pulled even with opportunity at being able to prove that liquid water had been present uh, in, in, there at some time in the past. Uh, but it really got quite exciting for us. We drove over to uh, Husband Hill. We drove up, and this is where we found that initial evidence for water. But then we drove down into a place called Inner Basin to a very fascinating feature called Home Plate. And that really was the site at which a number of additional exciting observations were made, relevant to this theme about habitable environments. We found at Home Plate uh, that it was a volcanically created feature. A violent volcanic eruption created the debris that formed this, this feature. It's shaped like a pancake about 90 meters across and just a couple meters high. Here you can see volcanic rocks all around it. Uh, they were probably from lava flows, but we, this, this deposit home plate was really a product of very violent volcanism. But for us, the most exciting observation was the discovery of almost pure silica deposits, purely opal and silica deposits around the perimeter, all the way around this side and down on the far side as you look at this image. We found the deposits that required liquid water for their deposition or their, their creation, which means now we have evidence for the volcanic activity occurring in concert with liquid water. Well, that's exciting. And why is that exciting? Because if we look at the Earth, and now we're at Yellowstone National Park, the Grand Prismatic Spring, a very large spring at the, in, in Yellowstone. And here you can see a, a rather large boardwalk going by it. And here is a 10-meter scale here. This type of an environment, which we could well now have evidence for on Mars, uh, is a type example of a habitable environment for microbial life on the Earth. Here, we, it's an oasis, obviously. You have near-surface water. Uh, the spring waters bring up chemicals that could provide sources of energy for life, like the sulfur gases, the hydrogen, uh, and some even cases the reduced iron that we see dissolved in some springs. These can be acted upon by microbes to obtain energy. And if, if that's not good enough, we have these mineral deposits, like pure silica, such as we have found at, um, at this uh, home plate feature on Mars, that could preserve evidence of life. And I can just call as an example petrified wood. I'm sure we're all familiar with that, where ancient tree trunks have been silicified by silica. And you see this beautifully faithful reproduction of all the woody features, the textures of wood uh, that were once present there with the tree. Likewise, silica can preserve fossils of microbial life, as we've seen at Yellowstone and then also in other ancient rocks on Earth. Uh, and therefore, hot springs can do this for us as well. And of course, this hot to cold transition from the spring out to the stream flows 
represents a range of conditions that could sustain a variety of organisms. And now we have found basically a place on Mars where an environment awfully similar to this has, has, you know, has potentially occurred and, and it could have been potentially habitable in the past. So in this way, we're making observations that advance further towards being able to establish that we might have had habitable environments for life on Mars. Maybe not life as plants and animals, but life as microorganisms. And this is an image that you can find in the Smithsonian Museum, Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., beautiful mural, trying to represent what we think the early Earth looked like with its volcanoes and its standing water and its hot springs and so forth. And in many ways, you could say that we have documented parallel features on Mars that may have all existed at the same time. And so we really are making progress towards uh, looking for habitable environments on Mars. These little funny yellowish features that you see here are an artist's representation of microbial colonies, what we call stromatolites or microbial reef structures. Of course, we haven't found those on Mars yet, but in that we're beginning to get smarter at looking at the right, for the, going to the right places to look for these features and have a higher chance of finding uh, fossil evidence. Not happened yet, but we're getting better at looking in the right neighborhoods. Okay, so let me now just return to this block, which shows that you need the water, the energy, and the nutrients in order to support life. And now to just raise the bar further. Okay, we may have found some of these places, but how long did these conditions last? And how much time does life need in order to, to get started and to survive? That's a really tough question. We've now got to go to the surface of Mars to a place where we could be reasonably convinced that things persisted for, let's just stick the, our neck out and say, you know, maybe millions of years. You know, you had inhabitable conditions that lasted for a very long time and that maybe that's adequate then to support life. And so in that regard, I'll move on to the next talk with our upcoming mission. But just before I do that, here's a couple of questions uh, from what we just talked about. What features were discovered by Opportunity Rover at Meridiani Planum that indicated that liquid water once existed there? And what is the evidence that the water had sometimes been on the surface? Okay, so that's the question uh, aimed at the Opportunity Rover. For Spirit, what features did Spirit Rover find at Gusev Crater that indicated that liquid water was present? And uh, so that's the parallel question for the Spirit Rover. So that's uh, for the previous section. Let's now move on. Uh, we are now, of course, um, as I give this talk, uh, poised here for uh, to see what the Mars Science Laboratory will find at the surface of Mars to continue this sort of coordinated exploration by orbiters and also by landers uh, of the most promising places at the surface of Mars. And so the Mars Science Laboratory now, uh, along those lines, has benefited from an even more extensive observation of the Earth surface of Mars by these advanced orbiters. And therefore, uh, we have found a very compelling landing site for this, for this rover to go to. Uh, a little couple of comments about the capability of the Curiosity rover. Like the Mars Exploration rovers, it has a very nice camera, set of cameras really, to make those field geology observations that any geologist would need to make in order to, to find the best places to explore. It obviously has mobility with its wheel system, much like the Mars Exploration rovers did. And also like them, it has an arm which can look out with a hand lens closely at the rocks and also do some analyses of these rocks for their elemental abundances. It also, though, though, has a very important capability to bring samples back and put them inside the laboratory, which is why we call this the Mars Science Laboratory mission. We have an instrument that can do x-ray analyses to determine the minerals that might be present, and we also have an instrument within the body of this rover that can look at organic compounds if they're present or to analyze gases or other volatile type species that might be present in the samples. And so in that respect, it can do a much more detailed analysis of samples than what the Mars Exploration rovers did. It's a much bigger rover. This one's about the size of a Jeep, whereas the others were the size of riding lawnmowers. Uh, looking a little more closely, and I'll just allude to these and move on, we see the remote sensing instruments, the cameras, and and a chem cam, which can actually shoot a little laser out and analyze the elements in, in a rock sample that might be out in front of the rover. So this is what we call our remote sensing capability. Then as we get up close and personal, we can put the arm out and contact the rock with instruments that can either look with a hand lens or determine the elemental composition. If we take a sample and put it inside the rover, we can do, as I said, chemical and isotopic 
measurements of organic matter or gases or whatever, and also with the other instrument, look at the minerals. And then, of course, this is also like a little roving weather station. Uh, it can um, not only um, do meteorology of, of what the climate is or the weather is like at the moment, but it actually can analyze radiation um, at the field as well as subsurface availability of water, of hydrogen, actually. So a very sophisticated rover. We're really looking forward to these analyses. Uh, the mission overview of how it gets there, of course, is we launch it from the Earth. And this occurred in November, actually uh, November of 2011. Uh, as I give this talk, we're currently cruising towards Mars to arrive August 6th, East Coast time. Then we go through an entry, descent, and landing phase. And for this, I'd like to just show a couple of videos. Uh, the first video, and, and uh, yeah, let's go through these. And these are available on the Mars um, Science Laboratory website. Um, what we're seeing now is the um, launch that occurred on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, 2011. Um, this is an Atlas V rocket. Uh, the fat part at the top of the rocket is the fairing that encloses the uh, rover itself and the entry descent stuff. Here now we see the blast off, which is a combination of liquid propulsion engines and solid engines that give the thrust necessary to get up through the lower part of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, as you can see, it was a partly cloudy day. Uh, some of us had better vantage points than the other, but these, this video that you're looking really shows the best of all worlds, vantage points from several places using telescopes to give you a sense of the various stages in the uh, launch of this Atlas V rocket. Uh, the first thing that will, major event that happens after the ignition and the launch will be the solid rockets that you see sort of around the back of the uh, rocket being ejected once they've done their work. Here we're still looking at the main engine's thrust and, uh, of course, very quickly getting the rock up uh, to high altitudes. Um, this image probably taken by, from a telescope that was downrange from the launching pad. Uh, those of us who witnessed the launch were just amazed to see these later. It's a beautiful set of images. And um, I think now, as, and also as this gets higher and higher in the atmosphere, you'll notice that the tail, the exhaust, is spreading out as the atmospheric pressure decreases that uh, uh, exhaust tail gets wider and wider. Now we see a beautiful close-up of, uh, uh, you can see the solid rockets are still firing around the perimeter of the main rocket, uh, and the, the tail begins to widen as the atmospheric pressure decreases. So uh, now it's, you can almost begin to, you can definitely see the, the flaring now, and um, still see the glow of the solid rockets. But now they're beginning to lose steam as they use up their propellant. And you can still see the liquid rockets uh, firing away there. We're now to the point where we really need to get rid of the, the weight uh, of those solid rockets, uh, which you'll see them peeling off shortly here as they, there it goes, there they go. Okay, and of course we do this to make this a much more weight efficient uh, spacecraft and the liquid rockets continue to burn. This will, uh, this, you'll, you'll continue to see the uh, tail flare out and the rocket gets smaller and harder to see. Uh, and I think perhaps at this point uh, we could just transition from this to the next uh, video, which is now that that has gotten into an orbit. It actually never orbits the Earth completely. Uh, we get up into an orbital altitude, but then we cruise out over across Africa into the Indian Ocean, and this is sort of where we are now. We're now over the Indian Ocean. You can see now the upper stage is just fired to make sure we're in the right trajectory. It is now positioning the spacecraft in order to be inserted out of Earth orbit and towards Mars. And so you can see now it's taken on this angle. You can see the little rockets firing to make sure. And then also you can see we're giving a nice slow spin. This is spin stabilization. Once that's done, we get rid of that boost, that upper stage rocket. And now you're looking at the actual spacecraft that is heading off to Mars. It consists of two things. It consists of what's called the crew stage, that which you're seeing now, which are the solar panels that provide power to the spacecraft as it's cruising to Mars. And in the front, a sort of clamshell-shaped enclosure that it actually contains the rover and the entry descent landing hardware. And so eight and a half months later, and that would be now as in August of 2012, we dump the crew stage and pay tribute to all the engineers who designed that. It's always a very solemn moment. And now the... Um, the entry vehicle is going in, and of course we have to now deaccelerate from 13,000 miles an hour down to a much lower speed where we can deploy a parachute. 
So this now, as it accelerates towards Mars, it actually reaches that peak velocity of 13,000 miles an hour. You can see how it's maintaining attitude control with those little firings of the jets. It's tremendous heat that occurs as the friction of the atmosphere interacts with that heat shield. And it's a great way to slow it down. We're just deaccelerating right now, but in a way that doesn't burn up the spacecraft. We learned early on how to design these entry vehicles so that you can actually survive this coming in through the atmosphere. At some point then, we've gotten down to a speed that's slow enough to deploy, to deploy the parachute, and we don't need that heat shield anymore. Uh, it's done its job, and uh, once we get that parachute out, uh, and it's deploying at almost Mach 2, it's still over 1,000 miles an hour, uh, we can dump the heat shield, and now there's a radar on the spacecraft that can determine the location of the ground, and this determines the timing of everything uh, that you're going to see from here to the surface. For example, dropping of what we call the sky crane. This is actually a descent rocket assembly that takes us down and slows us down as we go to the surface to a very uh, modest speed to where uh, within a few hundred meters of the surface we can now lower the rover down from the uh, descent rocket, the, uh, the sky crane, and that's hence the name crane. It's basically got a tether that it can use to lower the uh, the rover down, and here you see a little close-up of the camera as it's looking at the surface. The camera's mounted on the rover, and it's telling us now what the surface around the landing site looks like. This will be quite useful once we get down and start driving around. Here you see now the sky crane lowering on a tether uh, the rover. It now has sensors which will tell it when that thing, when that rover touches the ground. And when that touches the ground, that'll trigger what you see happening next here. Uh, the sky crane now slowly lowering the rover to the surface. We actually put six wheels on the ground as part of the landing sequence. When it senses that it's landed, it cuts the cables and flies off, and it's programmed to fly far away and, frankly, crash uh, so that it doesn't interfere with the mission. Here we now have the rover on the ground, uh, and unlike with the Mars rovers that had to drive off a platform, we are on the ground and ready to go. However, for the first several weeks, we will be checking out all the very complicated systems on this rover, and it'll take us a while before we can actually strike out and explore the countryside. But this shows in the video uh, pretty much uh, a sequence that you could expect us to do once we get moving on Mars. We're looking around, figuring out the best places to go, and then driving, as you can see from the tracks here, up to something that looks quite promising, a layer of rocks here. We have our little laser on board. You'll see the little light there as it fires out and hits the rock. First of all, we're looking at it with our camera. Okay, that's a good place to shoot our laser. There you can see it, a little flickering light that is actually analyzing uh, the rock there. It looks promising, and it's so promising that we're now going to drive up and put our arm out. You can see now the arm of the rover being put out. First, to do a close-up observation of the rock with our microscopic imager, but then to drill into the rock and take a sample to bring back to our laboratory. And I think this is just jumping to the drill, where we now have a percussion drill that can sort of rotates and drills into the rock and obtains a sample for the, uh, you know, for the laboratory. And now we have put this powder that's come from the drill into our X-ray diffraction instrument called Kemen. Uh, and the little depiction here you see is of X-rays hitting the sample. You wouldn't actually be able to see this, but the light showing it here just illustrates it. And as it hits the various la layers of atoms in the mineral, uh, these uh, x-rays are bounced off at various characteristic angles to form these ring patterns that you see. And the spacing of those ring patterns and their relative intensities are a fingerprint for the actual mineral that's present. And it's a very, very diagnostic way of determining the minerals that are present. Even if we have never discovered a mineral before, uh, we can figure out what it is by this analysis. And so that's a little bit of a... a overview of the uh, capabilities that this rover can do. The question then is where are we going with that uh, and that is to Gale Crater. And You can see here over on the right side of the um, of the uh, Mercator map that I have shown several times a crater that's located right at the dichotomy boundary between uh, the southern highlands and the northern lowlands. Uh, Gale Crater uh, as with uh, Gusev Crater showed evidence that liquid water might have been there in the past uh, here is a close-up of that crater uh, showing that it's it's pretty good size. It's 155 kilometers in diameter, um, but it has quite a, a quite a relief inside of it. If you look at the little scale bar over here, you can see that it's several kilometers in depth. And unlike 
Gusev crater, we can look at this with our more advanced orbiters and say that the uh, surface is not covered with lava flows. It's actually covered with deposits that may well have borne the evidence of liquid water. So right there, we have an advantage over Gusev crater here at Gale. Uh, and the other interesting thing about Gale, again, it's about 155 kilometers across. It has the central mound in the middle. And it has layers in, this, in the mound. And it indi it's indicated that these layers formed perhaps over a very extended period of time. And so the question then is, how much has water influenced these layers? And what kind of story could we reconstruct uh, uh, about the history of the, of the deposition of these layers? Where I'm showing the arrow now is our landing site at Gale, where uh, it's safe to land. You can see it's relatively flat. And then so we land where it's safe. And then we drive over to where it's, it's scientifically interesting, namely to begin to analyze the lower layers of this mound uh, in the center of Gale Crater. Uh, what's exciting about it is illustrated in this diagram. Uh, you're looking at the lower part of the mound here, where that safe area is to the upper left, and the upper part of the mound is to the lower right. So you're looking at a slope sort of going from the lower right down to the upper left. These colors are meant to represent different minerals, and they're listed here on the left side. All of these minerals are formed by some kind of interaction with water. Uh, the most easy ones to see about that are the clay minerals, which are shown here uh, in sort of the light blue uh, color in their scale. So you can see that there are clay minerals here. But also, there's other minerals like sulfates, just like the ones that Opportunity found at Meridiani, indicating also water interactions. Keyserite is a sulfate mineral, as are these darker uh, blue uh, indicated minerals here. And so, and then we have clays in the form of natronite and what we call smectite clays shown here in yellow. So we have layers that are very rich in minerals that right at the get-go, we can tell you, involve liquid water. And so this is very exciting for us uh, as a target to go and actually explore. So this will be the first time now where we have a rover that can go to a place and see clay minerals that were identified from the orbit. And that's because the clay minerals were found long after the Mars, two Mars rovers were launched and, and landed. And so now we have this unique opportunity, really, to pair a compelling orbital observation with a landed exploration. And so we have uh, this mound showing very interesting minerals. And as if that's not enough, these blue features that you see here represent evidences of standing water that occurred even after this mound was formed. So the mound tell us that, tells us that at one point this crater was completely filled with sediments. Then, the sub, mo, some of the sediments were taken away by some process. And we were compelled to think that it actually may have been wind that did this. And so a considerable period of time must have passed while all this was happening. And then after that, we have evidence that water was standing in this sort of moat-like area around the perimeter of the, of the central mound. And so we have evidence that water was involved in the formation of the mound, that time passed for that mound to be eroded down, or for the sediments to be removed to reveal the mound and then water that formed in the moat surrounding the mound. So this, perhaps, is our most compelling site <coughs> for the argument that liquid water much have must have persisted over an extended period of time. So maybe this is really one of the best places to go to really address the question about a habitable environment occurring on early Mars. And so we're very excited about that. Here's another view that, similar to the one I showed earlier of the landing site. The little green squiggle here showing the um, traverse that we would take up through the lower mound to explore some of those very um, interesting uh, clay layers and sulfate layers to really see what kind of story they can tell us about this early environment, an environment that may have persisted for millions of years as best as we can tell. And this just shows uh, sort of the distance that we have to drive from where we land, assuming that we land in the middle of the safe area, uh, and the elevation in kilometers that we don't really have to climb very much compared to the distance we're driving to get to some of these very interesting deposits. So even though the mound looks intimidating at first, our analyses from orbit indicate that we should be able to achieve uh, these, several of these very interesting sites within a reasonable lifetime period of time in the mission and at elevations that are not that challenging to attain. Uh, this is an interesting view showing some of the deposits that were formed perhaps associated with those lakes that were in the moats. Uh, this area around the base of the mound and then going up into the mound itself. Very interesting terrain that the rover would traverse, sort of as my arrow indicates here, uh, to, to interrogate these different layers to see what story they can tell about that early environment. 
And so it's very, it should be a very visually compelling mission. This is con created from orbital images that allow us to do a stereo reconstruction of what the surface looks like. But of course, we'll get much more compelling images once we're on the ground with our rover. Uh, again, just to recapitulate the kind of traverse that we might take as we drive along, driving up into the mound and encountering, as these colors indicate, some of these very interesting minerals that could tell us the story about the early environment in Gale Crater. Uh, going up even further, you can imagine what the scenery is going to look like as we drive up into this canyon and we begin to encounter stream type deposits that are bringing materials down from an upper part of the mound that we may never be able to visit directly, but we can analyze based on the material that has been brought down by this stream channel. So, I mean, we could be reading millions and millions of years of history by traversing in a very sort of guided way uh, up the side of the flanks of this mound. So, we're very excited about this site and, um, and the capabilities that the rover brings to it. And just to sort of finish this off, we can compare, compare the Gale Mound here, sort of illustrated on the right, uh, with the se sequence of rocks that you could see at the Grand Canyon in Arizona. And it's a visually compelling uh, set of rocks to look at, for, as anybody who's gone to that park can attest. But it also can, contains an amazing record of, of Earth history that spans hundreds of millions of years. And that's the point. Perhaps Gale also contains a remarkably informative record. And as you can see here, it actually continues up even higher. Uh, a, a parallel record of, of a period of Mars history that is very relevant to our search for habitable environments and life on Mars. And so I think this comparison with Grand Canyon illustrates our level of excitement and anticipation of the, for this mission. And again, the point to be, being to try to reconstruct what an early environment on Mars might, be, might have been like, analogous to our efforts in the past to reconstruct early Earth environments with implications for understanding better the early history of our biosphere. And of course, ultimately, by finding the right time of site and making the kind of compelling observations that we feel the, upper, the, the Curiosity rover can do, we'd be in a position to select samples to bring back to Earth. So now we have this uh, wonderful juxtaposition of going to one of the most compelling sites on Mars for the potential for life and bringing samples back to the most uh, capable state-of-the-art instruments in existence, which of course are the instruments that we have on the Earth. And this is the great promise that we look forward to with the Mars Sample Return Mission. And we look forward to the Mars Science Laboratory Mission to make additional compelling arguments, uh, observations to bring closer to the, uh, in the future, the, the day we can do the sample return mission. And with that, that's our summary of Mars exploration and the discoveries we've made and the exciting future that we can look forward to. Thanks. <laughs>